rise up and take on back this land. Tell me, are you going to be ready when the revolution comes? Yeah, are you going to be ready when the revolution comes? It's not a question of if, it's just a question of when. Tell me, are you going to be ready when the revolution comes? Now listen here, when tyrants tremble sick with fear and hear their death knell ring in, when the people rejoice both far and near, how can I keep from singing? Great to be here, Dean. Thank you so much for the invitation to be with you all today. Uh, it's good to be with you. Good morning, everyone. And I, I know we're in Zoom land, but I think initiating a little bit of back and forth might be nice. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. All right, there we go. Good okay. morning. Now mute yourselves. Come on, hurry up. No, um, <laughs> hopefully just for a bit as we hear from a terrific guest speaker today. Uh, first, I do want to mention um, that uh, Sandra Ruiz Harris is also instrumental at E5, along with my co-producer, uh, Seren Mudliar, um, involved with Shelter and Solidarity. I did put a link to that to this Shelter and Solidarity project in the chat box for anyone who would like to follow up. That's how I encountered Dean uh, for the second time. Uh, and we've been working together more closely lately. Uh, today, I have, I also want to thank Dean and Rob for that terrific music. Uh, it was really moving. I, I love that song, that, that first song in particular. Uh, Dean, uh, When the Revolution Come, uh, seems perfect for our, for our moment. I am humbled and honored today to uh, have the privilege of introducing to you a man that no doubt needs no introduction for many on this call. Uh, one of the forceful, fearless, seemingly indefatigable public truth tellers of our time, Chris Hedges. Uh, Chris, as many of you know, is a prolific author and commentator. Uh, his most recent book is America, the Farewell Tour. He's also a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist who was a foreign correspondent for 15 years with the New York Times, where he served as a Middle East bureau chief and Balkan bureau chief for the paper. Uh, he is the host of the Emmy Award nominated RT America show On Contact. And his reportage, social criticism and commentary span decades and a wide range of deeply connected topics. He writes prolifically on issues of domestic politics, the rise of corporate state power, um, the, the kind of underreported class war that structures American society, hollowing out our democratic institutions from within. He also writes on issues of war and imperialism. He is a staunch, um, informed, long running critic of what we might call neo-fascist currents, what he has referred to as Christian fascist movements in the United States, but also an unsparing and principled critic of the liberal establishment from the Democratic National Committee to the New York Times for which he formerly worked. He is a critic of both neo-fascism and neoliberalism. He is not only a reporter and a writer and author, but also an educator um, teaching at universities, but also in prisons. Um, he, as I understand, has authored or co-edited, produced, I'm not sure exactly what the right verb is, uh, a, a new play. He's helped uh, composed of Prisoner Stories, a play referred to as uh, by the title Caged, which I'm very interested to hear more about. Uh, he is someone who values the, the humanities and the literature and not only criticizes politics and institutional establishment power, but also turns that same critical eye to cultural practices, cultural norms, cultural trends that afflict and affect life in the United States and beyond, attending not only to the powers out there, the capitalist neoliberal kind of erosion of institutions out there, but also the ways in which those forces out there get in here, in uh, that threaten the hearts and minds, culture, spiritual, intellectual, and community life of people who may themselves not in fact be in power, but nonetheless are affected by it in many ways, whether they want it want to be or not. He is the author of among other books, Wages of Rebellion, War is a Force that Gives Us Meaning, Empire of Illusion, American Fascist, Death of the Liberal Class, and uh, Days of Destruction, Days of Rage. His topic for today, I've been told, is culture of despair, the culture of despair. And I can think of uh, no speaker who could illuminate this topic with as much 
insight and courage uh, and unsparing principled as Chris Hedges. So Chris, thanks so much for being here. We've never met before, but I've been following you for years and I'm really eager to hear what you have to say. Uh, after Chris speaks, we'll have some music. Um, we'll, um, I think you'll hear an announcement or a request from the host of Community Church of Boston. Then I will give Chris a couple questions to start things off and give folks a little chance to get the gears rolling for, for Q&A. And then we'll have hopefully a very lively discussion and exchange with this wonderful speaker. Thank you for being here, Chris. The floor is yours. Very much. <clears throat> I, the genesis of this talk comes from Fritz Stern, the German historian's work, The Politics of Cultural Despair, where he went back and examined <clears throat> what were the cultural forces that gave rise to fascism, uh, pinpointing, of course, widespread despair in Weimar, uh, as Hannah Arendt did in The Origins of Totalitarianism. Uh, and so that is really uh, what I was exploring in my last book, America the Farewell Tour, where I looked at the self-destructive pathologies uh, that are rippling across the country caused by despair. Uh, and that's the focus of the talk this morning. The physical and moral decay of the United States and the malaise that has spawned have predictable results. We have seen in varying forms the consequences of social and political collapse during the twilight of the Greek and Roman empires, the Ottoman and Habsburg empires, Tsarist Russia, Weimar Germany, and the former Yugoslavia, which I covered for the New York Times. Voices from the past, Aristotle, Cicero, Fyodor Dostoevsky, Joseph Roth, and Mila Van Gilas warned us. But blinded by self-delusion and hubris, as if we are somehow exempt from human experience, and human nature, we refuse to listen. The United States is a shadow of itself. It squanders its resources in feudal military adventurism, a symptom of all empires in decay as they attempt to restore a lost hegemony by force. Vietnam, Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Libya, tens of millions of lives wrecked, failed states, enraged fanatics, there are 1.8 billion Muslims in the world, 24% of the global population, and we have turned virtually all of them into our enemies. We are piling up massive government deficits at triple this year to $3.1 trillion, and neglecting our basic infrastructure, including electrical grids, roads, bridges, and public transportation, to spend more on our military than all the other major powers on Earth combined. We are the world's largest producer and exporter of arms and munitions. The virtues we argue we have a right to impose by force on others, human rights, democracy, the free market, the rule of law, and personal freedoms are mocked at home, where grotesque levels of social inequality and austerity programs have impoverished most of the public, destroyed democratic institutions, including Congress, the courts, and the press, and created militarized forces of internal occupation that carry out wholesale surveillance of the public, run the largest prison system in the world, and gun down unarmed citizens in the streets with impunity. The American burlesque, darkly humorous, with its absurdities of Donald Trump, fake ballot boxes, conspiracy theorists, who believe the deep state and Hollywood run a massive child sex trafficking ring, Christian fascists that place their faith in magic Jesus and teach creationism as science in our schools, 10 hour long voting lines in states such as Georgia, militia members planning to kidnap the governors of Michigan and Virginia and start a civil war is also ominous, especially as we ignore the accelerating ecocide. All of our activism, protests, lobbying, petitions, appeals to the United Nations, the work of NGOs, and misguided trust in liberal politicians such as Barack Obama have been accompanied by a 60% rise in global carbon emissions since 1990. Estimates predict another 40% in global emissions in the next decade. We are less than a decade away from carbon dioxide levels reaching 450 parts per million, the equivalent to a two degrees Celsius average temperature rise, a global catastrophe. 
that will make parts of the earth uninhabitable, flood coastal cities, dramatically reduce crop yields, and result in suffering and death for billions of people. This is what is coming, and we can't wish it away. Despair is killing us. It eats into the social fabric, rupturing social bonds, and manifests itself in an array of self-destructive and aggressive pathologies. It fosters what the anthropologist Roger Lancaster calls poison solidarity, the communal intoxication forged from the negative energies of fear, suspicion, envy, and the lust for vengeance and violence. After four years of lies, the stoking of racist violence, stunning ineptitude, flagrant corruption, and an abject failure to cope with a national health crisis, Trump expanded his base by 11 million votes. Those 74 million are absolutely frightening. The civil rights attorney Michael Cord said of those who voted for Trump, they want a moron to be a permanent dictator. That's what they want. They want to go back to the Jim Crow era. They want to disenfranchise Americans. They want to go back to the anti-science era of the dark ages. They want to go back to or create the handmaiden's tale. This is not hyperbole. Worse, 70% of Trump voters, 51, Ameri 51 million Americans, believe that, quote, radical left Democrats, end quote, and anti-Trump election officials rigged the elections through various forms of voter fraud, including Venezuelan voting software and counterfeit mail-in ballots to steal the election. 126 Republican House members joined a lawsuit filed by 18 Republican state attorneys general asking the US Supreme Court to overturn Biden's victory. The majority of Republican senators refused to acknowledge the election results following the November vote. Trump may be gone, but he leaves behind a party that is openly authoritarian, dismissive of democratic norms and attempted to carry out a coup. Electors from the electoral college were forced in many states to deliver their votes to state legislatures under armed guard. Armed protesters surrounded the home of Democratic Michigan Secretary of State, Jocelyn Benson, demanding that she, quote, stop the steal of the election from the president. 700 members of the white nationalist group, the Proud Boys, took over streets in Washington last weekend to protest the theft of the election, leading to more than three dozen arrests, four stabbings, four black churches being vandalized and Black Lives Matter banners and signs ripped down and burned. Nations in terminal decline, as Sigmund Freud understood, embrace the death instinct, no longer sustained by the comforting illusion of inevitable human progress. They lose the only antidote to nihilism. No longer able to build, they confuse destruction with creation. They descend into an atavistic savagery, something not only Freud, but Joseph Conrad and Primo Levi knew lurks beneath the thin veneer of civilized society. Reason does not guide our lives. Reason, as Schopenhauer puts it, echoing Hume, is the hard pressed servant of the will. Men are not gentle creatures who want to be loved and who at the most can defend themselves if they are attacked. Freud wrote, they are on the contrary creatures among whose instinctual endowments is to be reckoned a powerful share of aggressiveness. As a result, their neighbor is not for them, not only a potential helper or sexual object, but also someone who tempts them to satisfy their aggressiveness on him, to exploit his capacity for work without compensation to use him sexually without his consent, to seize his possessions, to humiliate him, to cause him pain, to torture and kill him. Homo homini lupus, who in the face of all this experience of life and history will have the courage to dispute this assertion. As a rule, this cruel aggressiveness waits for some provocation or puts itself at the service of some other purpose 
whose goal might also have been reached by milder measures. In circumstances that are favorable to it, when the mental counterforces, which ordinarily inhibit it, are out of action, it also manifests itself spontaneously and reveals man as a savage beast to whom consideration towards his own kind is something alien. Freud, like Primo Levi, got it. The moral life is often a matter of circumstances. Moral consideration, and I saw this in the wars I covered, largely disappears in moments of extremity. It is often the luxury of the privileged. 10% of any population is cruel no matter what, and 10% is merciful no matter what, and the remaining 80% can be moved in either direction, Susan Sontag said. To survive, it was necessary, Levy wrote of life in the death camps, to quote, throttle all dignity and kill all conscience, to climb down into the arena as a beast against other beasts, to let oneself be guided by those unsuspected subterranean forces which sustain families and individuals in cruel times. It was, he wrote, a Hobbesian life, a continuous war of everyone against everyone, Varlam Shalomov imprisoned for 25 years in Stalin's gulags was equally pessimistic. All human emotions of love, friendship, envy, concern for one's fellow man, compassion, a longing for fame, honesty had left us with a flesh that had melted from our bodies during our long fasts. The camp was a great test of our moral strength, of our everyday morality, and 99% of us failed it. Conditions in the camps do not permit men to remain men. That is not what camps were created for. Social collapse will bring these latent pathologies to the surface. But the fact that circumstances can reduce us to savagery does not negate the moral life. As our empire implodes and with its social cohesion, as the earth increasingly punishes us for our refusal to honor and protect the systems that give us life, triggering a fight for diminishing natural resources and huge climate migrations, we must face this darkness, not only around us, but within us. The dance macabre is already underway. Hundreds of thousands of Americans die each year from opioid overdoses, alcoholism, and suicide. What sociologists call deaths of despair. This despair fuels high rates of morbid obesity, some 40% of the public, gambling addictions, the pornification of the society with the ubiquitous images of sexual sadism, along with the proliferation of armed right-wing militias and nihilistic mass shootings. As despair mounts, so will these acts of self-immolation. Those overwhelmed by despair seek magical salvations, whether in crisis cults, such as the Christian right, or demagogues, such as Trump, or rage-filled militias that see violence as a cleansing agent. As long as these dark pathologies are allowed to fester and grow, and the Democratic Party has made it clear it will not enact the kinds of radical social reforms that will curb these pathologies, the United States will continue its march towards disintegration and social upheaval. Removing Trump will neither halt nor slow the descent. More than 300,000 Americans are now dead from the pandemic, a figure that is expected to rise to 400,000 in January and half a million in February. Chronic underemployment and unemployment, close to 20%, when those who have stopped looking for work, those furloughed with no prospect of being rehired, and those who work part-time but are still below the poverty line are included in the official statistics instead of being magically erased from the unemployment rolls. Our privatized healthcare system, which is making record profits during the pandemic, is not designed to cope with a public health emergency. It is designed to maximize profit for its owners. There are fewer than 1 million hospital beds nationally, a result of the decades-long trend 
of hospital mergers and closures that have reduced access to care in communities across the nation. Cities such as Milwaukee have been forced to erect field hospitals. In states such as Mississippi, there are often no ICU beds available. The for-profit healthcare service did not stockpile the ventilators, masks, drugs, or tests to deal with COVID-19. Why should it? This is not a route to, to increased revenue. And there is no substantial difference between Trump and Biden's response to the health crisis, where as many as 3,000 people are now dying per day. 48% of frontline workers remain ineligible for sick pay. Some 43 million Americans have lost their employer-sponsored health insurance. There are thousands of bankruptcies a day, with perhaps two-thirds of them tied to exorbitant medical costs. Food banks are overrun. Roughly 10 to 14 million renter households or 23 to 34 million people were behind on their rent in September. That amounts to 12 to 17 billion in unpaid rent. And that figure is expected to rise to $34 billion in past due rent in January. The lifting of the moratorium on evictions and foreclosures will mean that millions of families, many destitute, will be tossed onto the street. Hunger in US households almost tripled between 2019 and this year, according to the Census Bureau and the Department of Agriculture. The proportion of American children who do not have enough to eat, the study found, is 14 times higher than it was last year. A study by Columbia University found that since May, there are 8 million more Americans who can be classified as poor. Meanwhile, the 50 richest Americans hold as much wealth as half of the United States. Millennials, some 72 million people, have 4.6% of US wealth. Only one thing matters to the corporate state. It is not democracy. It is not truth. It is not the consent of the governed. It is not income inequality. It is not the surveillance state. It is not endless war. It is not jobs. It is not the climate emergency. It is the primacy of corporate power, which has extinguished our democracy, taken from us our most basic civil liberties and left most of the working class in misery and the increase and in consolidation of corporate power's wealth and power. Media outlets peddle a consumer version of what George Orwell in his novel 1984 called the two minutes of hate. Our opinions and prejudices are skillfully catered to and reinforced with the aid of a detailed digital analysis of our proclivities and habits and then sold back to us. The result, as Matt Taibbi writes, is packaged anger just for you. The public is unable to speak across the manufactured divide. Politics under the assault is atrophied into a tawdry reality show centered on manufactured political personalities. Civic discourse has been poisoned by invective and lies. Power, meanwhile, is left unexamined and unchallenged. Political coverage is modeled, as Taibbi points out, on sports coverage. The sets look like the sets on Sunday NFL countdown. The anchor is on one side. There are four commentators, two from each team around him. Graphics keep us updated on the score. Political identities are reduced to easily digestible stereotypes, tactics, strategy, image. The monthly tallies of campaign contributions and polling are endlessly examined while real political issues are ignored. It is the language and imagery of war. This coverage masks the fact that on nearly all the major issues, the two ruling political parties are in complete agreement. The deregulation of the financial industry, trade agreements, the militarization of police, and the Pentagon has transferred more than $7.4 billion in excess military gear and hardware to nearly 8,000 federal and state law enforcement agencies since 1990. The explosion in the prison population, 
deindustrialization, austerity, support for fracking and the fossil fuel industry, the endless wars in the Middle East, the bloated military budget, the control of elections and mass media by corporations, and the wholesale government surveillance of the population. And when the government watches you 24 hours a day, you cannot use the word liberty. That's the relationship between a master and a slave. All have bipartisan support. And for this reason, these issues are almost never discussed. The goal is to pit demographic against demographic. This stoking of antagonism is not news. It is entertainment driven not by journalism, but marketing strategies to increase viewership and corporate sponsors. News divisions are corporate revenue streams competing against other corporate revenue streams. The template for news, as Taibbi writes in his book, Hate Inc., the cover of which has Sean Hannity on one side and Rachel Maddow on the other, is the simplified morality play used in professional wrestling. <coughs> there are only two real political positions in the United States. You love Trump or you hate him, which comes from the playbook of professional wrestling. But if you voted for Biden and the Democratic Party, you did vote for something. You voted to endorse the humiliation of courageous women, such as Anita Hill, who confront their abusers. You voted for the architects of the endless wars in the Middle East. You voted for the apartheid state of Israel. You voted for wholesale surveillance of the public by government intelligence agencies and the abolition of due process and habeas corpus. You voted for austerity programs, including the destruction of welfare, and cuts to social security. You voted for NAFTA, free trade deals, deindustrialization, a real decline in wages, the loss of hundreds of thousands of manufacturing jobs and the offshoring of jobs to underpaid workers who toil in sweatshops in Mexico, China, or Vietnam. You voted for the assault on teachers and public education and the transfer of federal funds to for-profit and Christian charter schools. You voted for the doubling of our prison population, the tripling and quadrupling of sentences and huge expansion of crimes meriting the death penalty. You voted for militarized police who gunned down poor people of color with impunity. You voted against the new Green Deal, the Green New Deal and immigration reform. You voted for the fracking industry. You voted for a segregated public school system in which the wealthy receive educational opportunities and poor people are denied a chance. You voted for punitive levels of student debt and the inability to free yourself of those debt obligations even if you file for bankruptcy. You voted for deregulating the banking industry and the abolition of Glass-Steagall. You voted for the for-profit insurance and pharmaceutical corporations and against universal health care. You voted for defense budgets that consume more than half of all discretionary spending. You voted for the use of unlimited oligarchic and corporate money to buy elections. And you voted for a politician who during his time in the Senate abjectly served the interests of MBNA, the largest independent credit card company headquartered in Delaware, which also employed Biden's son, Hunter. Biden was one of the principal architects of the wars in the Middle East, where we have squandered upwards of $7 trillion and destroyed or extinguished the lives of millions of people. Biden is responsible for far more suffering and death at home and abroad than Trump. And if we had a functioning judicial and legislative system, Biden, along with the other architects of our disastrous imperial wars, Corporate plundering of the country and betrayal of the American working class would be put on trial, not offered up as a solution to our political and economic debacle. The Democrats and their liberal apologists adopt tolerant positions on issues regarding race, religion, immigration, women's rights, and sexual identity, and pretend this is politics. These issues are societal or ethical issues, and they are important but they are not social or political issues. The seizure of control of the economy by a class of global speculators and corporations has ruined 
the lives of the very groups the Democrats pretend to lift up. When Bill Clinton and the Democratic Party, for example, destroyed the old welfare system, 70% of the recipients were children. Those on the right of the political spectrum, and we must never forget that the positions of the Democratic Party would make it a far right party in Europe, demonize those on the margins of society as scapegoats. These culture wars mask the reality. Both parties are full partners in the destruction of our democratic institutions. Both parties have reconfigured American society into a mafia state. It only depends on how you want it dressed up. The power of politicians such as Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, or Mitch McConnell comes from being able to funnel corporate money to anointed candidates. In a functioning political system, one not saturated with corporate cash, they would not hold power. They have transformed what the Roman philosopher Cicero called a commonwealth, a res publica, a public thing, or the property of a people into an instrument of pillage and repression on behalf of a global corporate oligarchy. We are serfs ruled by the obscenely rich, omnipotent masters who loot the US treasury, pay little or no taxes, and have perverted the judiciary, the media, and the legislative branches of government to strip us of civil liberties and give them the freedom to engage in tax boycotts, financial fraud, and theft. In the midst of the pandem pandemic crisis, what did our ruling kleptocrats do? They looted $4 trillion on a scale unseen since the 2008 bailout overseen by Barack Obama and Joe Biden. They gorged and enriched themselves at our expense while tossing crumbs out of the windows of their private jets, yachts, penthouses, and palatial estates to the suffering and despised masses. The CARES Act handed trillions in funds or tax breaks to oil companies, the airline industry, which alone got $50 billion in stimulus money, the cruise ship industry. It gave a $170 billion windfall to the real estate industry. It handed subsidies to private equity firms and lobbying groups whose political action committees gave almost $200 million in campaign contributions to politicians in the last two decades. It bailed out the meat industry and corporations that have moved offshore to avoid US taxes. The act allowed the largest corporations to gobble up, gobble up money that was supposed to keep small businesses solvent to pay workers. It gave 80% of tax breaks under the stimulus package to millionaires and allowed the wealthiest to get stimulus checks that averaged $1.7 million. The CARES Act also authorized 450 $54 billion for the Treasury Department's Exchange Stabilization Fund, a massive slush fund doled out by Trump cronies to corporations that when leveraged 10 to one can be used to create a staggering $4.5 trillion in assets. The act authorized the Fed to give $1.5 trillion in loans to Wall Street, which no one expects will ever be paid back. And American billionaires have gotten $434 billion richer since the pandemic. Jeff Bezos, the richest man in the world whose corporation Amazon paid no federal taxes last year, alone added over $70 billion to his personal wealth since the pandemic started. And during this same time, 55 million Americans have lost their jobs. The molding of the public into warring factions works commercially, it works politically. It destroys, as it is designed to do, class solidarity, but is also a recipe for social disintegration. It propels us toward the kind of Hobbesian world Primo Levi and Sigmund Freud warned us about. I watched competing ethnic groups in the former Yugoslavia retreat into antagonistic tribes. They seized rival mass media outlets and used them to spew lies, 
mythological narratives exalting themselves, along with the vitriol and hate against the ethnicities they demonized. This poisoned solidarity, which we are replicating, pumped out month after month in Yugoslavia, destroyed the capacity for empathy, perhaps the best definition of evil, and led to a savage fratricide. The United States awash in military grade weaponry is already plagued by an epidemic of mass shootings. There are death threats against critics of Trump, including Representative Ilhan Omar. There was an aborted plot by 13 members of a right-wing militia group to kidnap and perhaps assassinate the governors of Michigan and Virginia and start a civil war. A Trump supporter mailed pipe bombs to prominent Democrats and CNN, an effort to decapitate the hierarchy of the Democratic Party as well as terrorize the media outlet that is the party's principal propaganda platform. The spark that usually sets such tinder ablaze is martyrdom. Aaron J. Danielson, a supporter of the right wing group Patriot Prayer, was wearing a loaded Glock pistol in a holster and had bear spray and an expandable metal baton when he was shot dead on August 29th allegedly by Michael Forrest Reinhold, a supporter of Antifa in the streets of Portland. A woman in the crowd can be heard shouting after the shooting, I am not sad that an effing fascist died tonight. Reinhold was ambushed and killed by federal agents in Washington state in what appears to be an act of extrajudicial murder, something I witnessed frequently during the war in El Salvador. Once people start being sacrificed for the cause, it takes little for demagogues to insist that self-preservation necessitates violence. Political stagnation and corruption along with economic and social misery spawn what anthropologists call crisis cults, movements led by demagogues that prey on an unbearable psychological and financial distress and champion violence as a form of moral purification. These crisis cults already well established among followers of the Christian right, right wing militia groups, and many supporters of Donald Trump who look at him not as a politician, but as a cult leader. Pedal magical thinking and an infantilism that promises if you surrender all autonomy, prosperity, restored national glory, a return to a mythical past order and security. Trump is a symptom. He is not the disease. And once he leaves office, far more competent and dangerous demagogues will rise if the social conditions are not radically improved to take his place. I fear we are headed towards a Christianized fascism. The greatest moral failing of the liberal Christian church, which I come out of, was its refusal, justified in the name of tolerance and dialogue, to denounce the followers of the Christian right as heretics. By tolerating the intolerant, it ceded religious legitimacy to an array of con artists, charlatans, and demagogues and their cultish supporters. It stood by as the core gospel message, concern for the poor and the oppressed, was perverted into a magical world where God and Jesus showered believers with material wealth and power. The white race became God's chosen agent. Imperialism and war became divine instruments for purging the world of infidels and barbarians, evil itself. Capitalism, because God blessed the righteous with wealth and power and condemned the immoral to poverty and suffering, became shorn of its inherent cruelty and exploitation. The iconography and symbols of American nationalism became intertwined with the iconography and symbols of the Christian faith. The mega pastors, narcissists who run despotic, cult-like fiefdoms make millions of dollars by using this heretical belief system to prey on the despair and desperation of their congregations, victims of neoliberalism and deindustrialization. These believers find in Trump, who preyed on this despair in his casinos and through his sham universities, and these mega pastors, champions of the unfettered greed, cult of masculinity, lust for violence, 
white supremacy, bigotry, American chauvinism, religious intolerance, anger, racism, and conspiracy theories that are the core beliefs of the Christian right. When I wrote American Fascist, the Christian Right in the War on America, I was quite serious about the term fascist. Tens of millions of Americans live hermetically sealed inside the vast media and educational edifice erected by the Christian right. In this world, miracles are real. Satan, allied with liberal secular humanists and the deep state, along with Muslims, immigrants, feminists, intellectuals, artists, and a host of other internal enemies, is streak seeking to destroy America. Trump is God's appointed vessel to build the Christian nation and cement into place a government that instills biblical values. These biblical values include, ba include banning abortion, protecting the traditional family, turning the Ten Commandments into secular law, crushing infidels, especially Muslims, indoctrinating children in schools with biblical teachings and thwarting sexual license, which includes any sexual relationship other than marriage between a man and a woman. Trump is routinely compared by evangelical leaders to the biblical King Cyrus, who rebuilt the temple in Jerusalem and restored the Jews to the city. Trump filled his own ideological void with this Christian fascism. He elevated members of the Christian right to prominent positions, including Mike Pence to the vice presidency, Mike Pompeo as secretary of state, Betsy DeVos, as Secretary of Education, Ben Carson, as Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, Bill Barr as Attorney General, Neil Gorsuch, Brett Kavanaugh, uh, and Amy Coney Barrett to the Supreme Court, and the televangelist Paula White to his Faith and Opportunities Initiative. More importantly, Trump handed the Christian right veto and appointment power over key positions in government, especially in the federal courts. He installed 133 district court judges out of 677 total, 50 appeals court judges out of 179, and three U.S. Supreme Court justice, justices. This is 19% of the federal trial judges currently in service, and nearly all of the extremists who make up the judicial appointees have been rated as unqualified by the American Bar Association, the country's largest nonpartisan coalition of lawyers. I studied ethics at Harvard Divinity School with James Luther Adams, who had been in Germany in 1935 and 1936. Adams witnessed the rise there of the so-called German Christian church, which was pro-Nazi. He warned us about the disturbing parallels between the German Christian church and the Christian right. Adolf Hitler was in the eyes of the German Christian church, a Volk Messiah, an instrument of God, a view similar to the one held today about Trump by many of his white evangelical supporters. Those demonized for Germany's economic collapse, especially Jews and communists were branded as agents of Satan. Fascism, Adams told us, always cloaks itself in a nation's most cherished symbols and rhetoric. Fascism would come to America not in the guise of stiff-armed, marching brown shirts and Nazi swastikas, but in mass recitations of the Pledge of Allegiance, the biblical sanctification of the state, and the sacralization of American militarism. Adams was the first person I heard label the extremists of the Christian right as fascists. And liberals, he warned, as in Nazi Germany, were blind to the tragic dimension of history and radical evil, and they would not react until it was too late. Liberals who expressed dismay or even more bizarrely, a fevered hope about the corporatists and imperialists selected to fill the positions in the Biden administration are the court jesters of our political burlesque. They long ago sold their soul and abandoned their most basic principles to line up behind a bankrupt Democratic Party. They chant with every election cycle the mantra of the least worst and sit placidly on the sidelines as a Bill Clinton or a Barack Obama and the Democratic Party leadership betrays every issue they claim to support. 
The only thing that mattered to liberals in the presidential race once again was removing a Republican, this time Donald Trump from office. This the liberals achieved. But their Faustian bargain in election after election has shredded their credibility. They are ridiculed, not only among right-wing Trump supporters, but by the hierarchy of the Democratic Party that has been captured by corporate power. No one can or should take liberals seriously. They stand for nothing, they fight for nothing. The cost is too onerous. And so the liberals do what they always do, chatter endlessly about political and moral positions they refuse to make any sacrifices to achieve. Liberals largely comprised of the professional managerial class that dutifully recycles and shops for organic produce and is concentrated on the two coasts have profited from the ravages of neoliberalism. They seek to endow it with a patina of civility, but their routine and public humiliation has ominous consequences. It not only exposes the liberal class as hollow and empty, it discredits the liberal democratic values they claim to uphold. Liberals should have abandoned the Democratic Party when Bill Clinton and political hacks such as Biden transformed the Democratic Party into the Republican Party and launched a war on traditional liberal values and left-wing populism. They should have defected by the millions to support Ralph Nader and other Green Party candidates. This defection, as Nader understood, was the only tactic that could force the Democrats to adopt parts of a liberal and left-wing agenda and save us from the slow motion corporate coup d'etat. Fear is the real force behind political change, not oily promises of mutual goodwill. Short of this pressure, this fear, especially with labor unions destroyed, there is no hope. And now we will reap the consequences of the liberal class's moral and political cowardice. The Democratic Party elites are reveling in taunting liberals, as well as left-wing populists who preach class warfare and supported Bernie Sanders. How are we supposed to interpret the appointment of Anthony Blinken, one of the architects of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, and a supporter of the apartheid state in Israel? or secret, as Secretary of State, or John Kerry, who championed the massive expansion of domestic oil and gas production, largely through fracking, and according to Barack Obama's memoir, worked doggedly to convince those concerned about the climate crisis to, and I quote, offer up concessions on subsidies for nuclear power industry and the opening of additional US coastlines to offshore oil drill, drilling as the new climate policy czar or Brian Deese, the executive who was in charge of the climate portfolio at BlackRock, which invests heavily in fossil fuels, including coal, and who served as a former Obama economic advisor who advocated austerity measures to run the White House's economic policy. Or Neera Tandon, for director of the Office of Management and Budget, who as the president of the Center for American Progress raised millions in dark money from Silicon Valley and Wall Street while relentlessly ridiculing Bernie Sanders and his supporters on cable news and social media, and who proposed a plank in the Democratic platform calling for the bombing of Iran. The Biden administration will resemble the ineffectual German government formed by Franz von Papen in 1932 that sought to recreate the Ancien Regime, a utopian conservatism that ensured Germany's drift into fascism. Biden, bereft like von Papen of new ideas and programs, will eventually be forced to employ the brutal tools Biden as a senator was so prominent in creating to maintain social control. Wholesale surveillance, a corrupt judicial system, the world's largest prison system, and police that have been transformed into lethal paramilitary units. Those that resist as social unrest mounts will be attacked as agents of a foreign power and censored as many already are being censored, including through algorithms and deplatforming on social media. The most ardent and successful dissidents, such as Julian Assange, will be criminalized. The shock troops of the state, already ideologically bonded with the neo-fascists on the right, will hunt down and wipe out an enfeebled and often phantom left, as we saw in the chilling 
state assassination of Reinhold, who was unarmed and standing outside an apartment complex in Lacey, Washington, when he was shot multiple times. Compare the gunning down of Reinhold by federal agents to the coddling of Kyle Rittenhouse, the 17-year-old accused of killing two protesters and injuring a third on August 25th in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Police officers moments before the shooting are seen on video thanking Rittenhouse and other armed right-wing militia members for coming to the city and handing them bottles of water. Rittenhouse is also seen in a video walking toward police with his hands up after his shooting spree as protesters yell that he has shot several people. Police nevertheless allow him to leave. Rittenhouse's killings have been defended by the right, including Trump, and he has received hundreds of thousands of dollars in donations for his legal fees and been released on a $2 million bail. Social unrest given a continuation of neoliberalism, the climate crisis, the siphoning off of diminishing resources to a bloated war machine, political stagnation, and the failure to contain the pandemic and its economic fallout is almost certain. Absent a left-wing populism, a disenfranchised working class will line up as it did with Trump behind a counterfeit, a right-wing populism. The liberal elites will, if history as any guide, justify state repression as a response to social chaos in the name of law and order that they too are on the Christian right and the corporate state's long list of groups to be neutralized will become evident to them when it is too late. All the pieces are in place for our own descent into what I expect will be a militarized, Christianized fascism, political dysfunction, a bankrupt and discredited liberal class, massive and growing social inequality, a grotesquely rich and tone deaf oligarchic elite, the fragmentation of the public into warring tribes, widespread food insecurity and hunger, chronic underemployment and unemployment and misery, all exacerbated by the failure of the state to cope with the crisis of the pandemic, will combine with the rot of civil and political life to create a familiar cocktail leading to authoritarianism and fascism. A constant barrage of vitriol and fabulous conspiracy theories will, I fear, embolden extremists to carry out political murder, not only of mainstream Democrats, Republicans, Trump is accused of betrayal, such as Georgia, the Georgia uh, governor, Brian Kemp, and those targeted as part of the deep state, but also those at media outlets, such as CNN or the New York Times that serve as propaganda arms for the Democratic Party. Once the Pandora's box of violence is opened, it is almost impossible to close. Martyrs on one side of the divide demand martyrs on the other. Violence becomes the primary form of communication. And as Sebastian Hoffner wrote, once the violence and readiness to kill that lies beneath the surface of human nature has been awakened and turned against other humans and even made into a duty, it is a simple matter to change the target. This. I suspect is what is coming. The blame lies not only with the goons and racists on the right, the corporatists who pillage the country and the cor corrupt ruling elite that does their bidding, but a feckless liberal class that found standing up for its beliefs too costly. The liberals will pay for their timidity and cowardice, but so will we. Thank you. Uh, so Chris, thank you so much for your remarks. Um, I'm going to leave a couple questions that are on my mind to, to folks that I know will follow. Marilyn has hit one in the chat box already, but I do, um, I want to, you know, preface my question by saying I realize, um, having read and, and seen you on a number of podcasts over the years and in preparation for today, that you're not a big fan of what you sometimes call peddling hope, right, or the, the mania for hope, uh, the, the, the sense that, right, as you make very clear again and again, the reason to fight against something isn't just because you have hope that you'll win, um, but because you morally, for whatever reason, feel that there's no option but to resist, no option but to stand up for what's right or against what's wrong. That said, I would like to ask you to step into the question of strategy a little bit, if you might. I mean, towards the end of your remarks, you mentioned that um, absent a left, what you call a left-wing populism, you see a very nightmarish spiraling um, kind of cycle of, of kind of doom and destruction. Um, 
kind of uh, continuing and, and escalating. I wonder if you could say a little more about what you see and envision that left wing populism, your term, uh, looking like uh, and to what degree uh, and in what places do you see signs of such a movement already emerging? Um, obviously, this COVID moment is a particularly difficult one uh, in, in terms of on the street in person activism, but I still would like to get a little sense of where you see movement that is promising uh, or at least um, an objective basis for hope, you might say, in terms of things we're seeing on the ground or in the internet. I know you're, you're, you're on a lot of these alternative media venues. Uh, where do you see uh, the left-wing populism? Uh, how do you envision it? But also where, if any, do you see signs of it already emerging? And I guess the, the follow-up to that would be, what, if any, do you see as the blockages on that potential that we need to work on removing to allow that, um, that necessary movement to really take full form. And, and, and in short, what do you what would you recommend people do today, even listening to this and um, watching this great discussion to uh, contribute to that to that necessary alternative? And I'll just leave it there. And then after this, maybe you can respond to that. And then we'll take questions from the group, perhaps in, in maybe in groups of two or three, so we can get as many voices as possible. Thanks, Chris. Well, you've seen upsurges of this going back to the Occupy movement. Uh, you saw it at Standing Rock. I was spent a lot of time in Zuccotti Park. I was at Standing Rock. Uh, you saw it after the uh, police murder of George Floyd. Uh, and you can always tell when these are authentic movements because uh, the state doesn't mess around. Uh, it was under Obama that there was a coordinated national effort to shut down all of the Occupy encampments. Uh, the uh, uh, use of private mercenaries, company goons, uh, state police uh, was brutal uh, in terms of Standing Rock, uh, as were the responses of the state uh, in many of the street protests uh, that we saw uh, following the deaths of Floyd and Breonna Taylor and others, uh, including, of course, an assault against the media. 117 journalists were arrested during those protests. So we have seen uh, an upsurge of those movements, all of which I strongly support and many of which I've been involved in, uh, but they are outside of the mainstream political establishment uh, as much as members of the Democratic Party might try and co-opt it. And Nancy Palente and her Kenty scarf or Muriel Brower, the mayor of Washington painting 35 foot tall letters on a street saying Black Lives Matter at the same time that she uh, is calling for a $50 million increase in the police budget and a bond uh, proposal to build a $500 million new jail. So, uh, but I don't think that my sense is that a lot of the people who are involved in the protests against uh, uh, brutal and indiscriminate police violence, a, a, fa a daily uh, reality for people in marginal communities, were buying that. Uh, yes, we've seen it. Uh, and we've also seen how the state will respond. So it's those, those are the kinds of Hi, activities that and I was a part of Extinction Rebellion. We uh, yeah. shut down the uh, street in front of the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, those are the activities that I put my energy into and that's where I find hope. But yes, you're right. In the end, we have a, it's a moral imperative to stand up against these police murders or stand up against the poisoning of uh, our land, uh, you know, as the indigenous leaders in Standing Rock did or decry the seizure of power by global financiers which was at the core of the Occupy movement. So uh, there, you know, in the end, uh, you know, we can't use the word hope if we don't resist, uh, nor can we use the word hope if uh, we embrace self-delusion. You know, the idea that somehow Joe Biden is, uh, it, you know, wasn't anointed by the oligarchic elite. We know he was. Uh, he, in fact, the major donors of the Democratic Party, uh, Lloyd Blankfein, the former CEO of Goldman Sachs and others, were very clear that if Sanders was the nominee, they would vote for Trump. This whole least worst option doesn't apply to them. It only applies to us because they're the ones that pull the strings. Yeah, th thank you, uh, Chris, for that. And I hope we can dig deeper into this question of left-wing populism, but with the help of the people who are on this Zoom call. Uh, I have uh, right now about six, seven people who have indicated they like to speak. I thought we could maybe take two and I'm sure, I think there'll be rich questions and then maybe take them two at a time, if that's all right, to give 
to hopefully leave some space uh, for as many voices as possible that we do have a good amount of time here, uh, about a half an hour uh, from what I've been told. Let's go to Rob, my comrade from Vermont, Robert Niemi, and then Marilyn Frankenstein, uh, an old uh, UMass Boston friend. So uh, yeah, Bob, make sure to unmute yourself. And to everyone else, please do mute yourself when you're not speaking. Uh, so that we don't... Keep getting that. Please, <clears throat> if you're not speaking. Yes, yeah, hello. And yeah, Bob, take it away. Yeah, hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, Chris. Hi, how are you? Yeah, um, the US obviously has a huge um, problem with structural un unemployment and underemployment. And uh, again, a, a vast proletariat that um, is basically economically and politically disenfranchised. Um, what do we do with that? I mean, that that's the source that in a way was the source of Trumpism to a great degree. Um, that sense of hopelessness that, um, you know, people in dead end jobs throughout the country or minimum wage wage jobs have uh, uh, experienced and you talked about deaths of despair and so on. Um, uh, how, how do we grapple with with an economic and political structure that that disenfranchises such a, a large portion of the population. Thank you, Bob. Let's also get, if we could, Chris, could we get uh, Marilyn in here first, and then we'll go back to you, Marilyn. Um, I, am I not? I'm not muted. You can hear me. I can hear you fine. Okay. Very, very quickly, just to reply a bit to what uh, Bob just said. My understanding of who voted for Trump against. Um, uh, Hillary was that it wasn't the poorest of the poor, that the working class basically voted for Hillary and it was the more um, uh, better off ones that were afraid that they were gonna lose their benefits to the blacks and that racism was a very, very big part of Trump. But my main comment um, is I think that Angela Davis was right I voted for Trump, uh, for uh, they're the same Biden and Trump. I completely agree with all of the criticisms, Chris, that you had, but I don't agree with the reality of the space that we're in. Angela Davis said, vote for Biden to give us some breathing room. And she wasn't naive, she wasn't liberal. I think that those of us, certainly me, who on the left voted for Biden voted to get rid of Trump, to give a little breathing space. So then we could try to have some realistic um, push. I'm actually shocked, final comment, that, he, that Biden appointed someone who was at Standing Rock to be Secretary of the Interior. Is that gonna do much? Who knows? But we gotta keep pushing. And now at least we can. Thank you, Marilyn. Thank you, Bob. Back to you, Chris, and then we'll take two more folks in a moment. Oh, I mean, with deindustrialization, you've turned your proletariat into the lumpen proletariat. Marks wrote quite a bit about the danger of the lumpen proletariat and how uh, it was often used by the most retrograde forces in any society. They became the shock troops of fascism. I think that's correct. Um, it was the urban industrial proletariat that primarily composed the Communist Party in Weimar, Germany. Uh, and so we've, we, we've created a kind of new situation where uh, all of the products that we consume are manufactured in sweatshops in China where people work 12 hours a day and there's wage theft and they have no rights and et cetera. Um, our own labor unions have been decimated. 6% of the workforce is laborized, is in labor unions. Uh, and so I would say that uh, somehow we have to rebuild the power of labor unions uh, you're seeing some activity with that. Uh, the nurses union is good. Uh, there's been some movement up among organizing, uh, among uh, fast food workers, uh, Walmart, which is effectively, you know, built a very effective union busting mechanisms. Most people who work at Walmart work 28 hours a week, puts them below the poverty line. Uh, the Walton family makes, you know, by, by not doing anything, $11,000 an hour. Uh, and they hand out forms for uh, food stamps because they're Walmart workers, uh, given the 
uh, poverty wages they're paid qualify. So we subsidize the Walmart fortune. So I think organizing is key. Um, but I think that, you know, the, the traditional uh, structures by which you build <coughs> systems uh, to uh, uh, fight against an oligarchic elite, i.e. Uh, uh, an employed working class, especially an industrial working class, is just not there anymore. Um, in terms of voters, I mean, the largest voting bloc is the 100 million people who don't vote, and they are the poorest of the poor. Um, uh, certainly, there's no question that racism is an endemic part of the Trump message. Uh, uh, but uh, I think that, that uh, to somehow write off Trump supporters as racist uh, ignores the fact that the Democratic Party betrayed the working class. Uh, so for instance, in my last book, America the Farewell Tour, I was in Anderson, Indiana. Now, Anderson, Indiana was one of the epicenters of GM. Huge factories, union jobs, $25 an hour, benefits, uh, job protection, et cetera. After NAFTA, uh, those factories were uh, moved to Monterey, Mexico. Uh, and uh, so you, the town went into a death, Anderson went into a death spiral, like many former industrial centers. Uh, they actually uh, uh, plowed the factories under uh, uh, so that they're just giant weed choked locks surrounded by cyclone fencing and the churches are boarded up and supermarkets are closing and uh, there's a opioid crisis and suicides are uh, rampant. Uh, and, and so what was interesting, I was with old UAW workers, they voted for Bernie Sanders uh, 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 in very large percentages. Uh, in the primary, this was 2016. Uh, but when Hillary Clinton became the nominee, they were never gonna vote for Clinton because they were acutely aware of how they'd been stabbed in the back to use an overworked metaphor by the Democratic Party establishment. So yes, of course, uh, the racism is a part, uh, but to somehow blame racism for the rise of Trump, uh, I think is to ignore the, the betrayal and the pain that uh, Democratic Party leadership really beginning under Clinton inflicted on the working class. And now with the bifurcation of the country into these warring demographics, it's almost impossible to communicate with them. So uh, I would say, you know, rebuilding uh, popular organizations in particular unions is key. Um, and, uh, and I think that when we address the real concerns of the working class, even if they support a Trump. I mean, for instance, as Nader has often said, if you, if you organize workers at a Walmart, many of whom may support Trump for a living wage, uh, you, uh, you are going to build an organization. I mean, all successful organizations have to include, if they're gonna work, people whose political opinions are uh, maybe even unpalatable to us. And I come out of, my, much of my family comes out of working class Maine uh, and, which was also destroyed by NAFTA. So I kind of see it firsthand. And yes, they express that betrayal in ways that I find even repugnant. Uh, uh, but I, I think that we really uh, will fail ourselves if we don't acknowledge the legitimacy of that anger and that pain. And Chris, do you want to speak to um, to Marilyn's point? I mean, she kind of made two points, but the second one was about the Angela Davis argument for Biden as breathing room, um, and and you know the, the question of if people, you know, whether, whether people were actually voting for Biden um, or really against Trump, and and kind of how you uh, weigh in on that on that question. I admire Angela Davis tremendously, but I don't agree with her. Um, it's not breathing room. What it what it does is essentially expose the spinelessness of the liberal elites who mouth rhetoric and then support candidates that uh, betray every issue they claim to care about. And that has a short-term gain and said, of course, we all want to get rid of Trump, but the long-term consequences, as I saw in Yugoslavia, are very dangerous. Um, and uh, I, I don't think we're getting breathing room. I think it's clear from the appointments that what we're getting is seeding the ground for a competent fascist like Tom Cotton or someone like this. I don't know who's going to rise. Pompeo wants to run. I mean, somebody who's not inept. I mean, we're sitting here watching the Trump White House attempt to orchestrate a coup d'etat. And the only reason it's with most of the Republican Party supporting it. And the only reason it's not working is because he's a buffoon and he's incompetent. 
uh, but put someone competent in there and it's finished. So uh, there is a short term gain. This is what the liberal class does in every election cycle. Uh, but the long term consequences are very uh, dangerous. Uh, and, uh, and I, you know, many of these kind of traditional liberal values are values that I support. I don't want to see eviscerated. Richard Rorty uh, in his book, his last book, Achieving Our Country, writes precisely about this issue. Uh, so uh, I, I was Nader's speechwriter. I, I think Ralph is right. We should have stepped out when the working class was betrayed and stood with the working class. Uh, and if we had done that by the millions, we would not have ended up with a Trump. I really see Trump as a result of the um, policies embraced by the Democratic Party establishment, Clinton, Biden, Obama. Well, it seems like, Chris, I mean, so far as you see people, some of Trump's vote as a vote against the Democratic establishment, you seem to be implying there may be more potential for some of that, at least those Bernie, those Bernie voters that then flipped away from Clinton to Trump or whatever, uh, that there may be, um, I don't want to say that word, that nasty word, hope, uh, or that, but but um, maybe some something um, you know something there that can be dug into. Let's go to the next folks uh, on the list. We have Mike Heikman and Libby. Uh, I agree with uh, what you're saying, Chris, about breathing room. Uh, look, look what's uh, happened. The cabinet, okay, there is an exception. Uh, uh, look at the uh, corporate Democrats attacking liberal Democrats like AOC. Where's the fight back? Where's the fight back? Um, uh, uh, I'm with the Boston May Day Coalition, and we're having a demonstration on January 20th uh, to put some demands on the new Congress and uh, and the and and the president. And uh, I haven't heard anything in terms of uh, using the inauguration day uh, in Massachusetts outside of the work that we're doing and around the country. It's like we should be mobilizing for a response on inauguration day. Uh, my major question is that uh, I'm with the Green Party in Massachusetts and I wanna thank you for your su principled support for the Green Party, but I don't think the Green Party is the solution either. Uh, one of the positive developments during the campaign is the different forces uh, that are coming out for to build a new independent uh, progressive political party. And what I think is needed is for those different forces to come together. Uh, do you agree with that analysis? And is there anything that you could do to support bringing those forces together? Thank you for everything that you do. I hope to be able to get a report, a recording of, of this presentation. Great, thanks, Mike. Let's go to Libby before we go back to Chris. Thanks, Joe. And um, hi, can you hear me? Yep. Great. Uh, hi, Chris, thank you so much for your comments. Um, Joe kind of asked, I, my question sort of in the, in the line of Joe's around the question of left-wing populism and strategy. Um, and I guess, um, I think, yeah, I'm interested in hearing more of your thoughts about um, how we strengthen the left um, and maybe, you know, even stepping away from the electoral politics that you focused on in this talk. Um, and I, I guess I'm thinking about the framing of sort of like the rise and fall of empires or the, or the collapse of the, of the American empire and also um, sort of globally, I'm interested in hearing how you're thinking about the interplay between right-wing forces and some of the more recent um, really exciting left-wing social movements. Uh, I'm thinking especially of uh, the indigenous struggle in Bolivia and, and the recent um, success of the of the socialists and um, also the uprisings in India with the farmers, um, the really incredible uprisings there and sort of that that interplay and how, I mean, how we can draw inspiration from, support, learn from um, those movements responding to, you know, increasing right-wing power, um, uh, how we can learn from those within the US. Um, sort of just gesturing to, to that whole area of things and, and curious for your thoughts. Great, thanks, Mike. Thanks, Libby. Back to you, Chris. Oh yeah, I, I mean, the Green Party and 
you know, I deal with it. <laughs> it is often dysfunctional. Um, although I did vote, of course, for Howie Hawkins um, and have not voted for a Democrat since before 2000 and won't. Uh, I think part of the problem with the self-identified left is that it has no real relationship with the oppressed. Um, and when you have personal relationships with the oppressed, uh, it becomes very hard to betray them. So for instance, I'm good friends with Julian Assange. I have been teaching in a prison for 10 years. Uh, I'm just not gonna walk out and cast my ballot, however symbolic that may be, for somebody who's gonna extradite someone like Julian and put him in prison for the rest of his life. Nor am I going to cast a ballot uh, after walking out of a prison classroom. I teach uh, in the New Jersey prison system through the college degree program run by Rutgers University. I mean, half of my students wouldn't be there, but for Joe Biden, am I supposed to walk out and they can't vote. They can't vote even when they get out of prison. Uh, and am I supposed to get out and vote for Biden? Uh, I've spent months of my life in Gaza. Uh, you know, these, you know, the suffering uh, and, and death that has been inflicted on the innocents by these policies. It, it, as long as it remains an abstraction, it's easier to walk in and support that system. And, and I think that, you know, we talk about hope. Uh, if you don't walk out of uh, an American prison and, and, and you're angry, then something's wrong with you. You don't have a heart. Uh, and I think a lot of my, or, you know, leaving Gaza, uh, or, you know, when I was able to visit Julian in the uh, embassy in Ecuador, where he spent seven years in under as a prisoner under house arrest, if you don't walk away from uh, those moments without anger uh, and determined to do everything humanly possible to fight back, then uh, I think, you know, you're emotionally deformed. And I think too often the left, uh, and I lived in, Boston, I actually lived in Roxbury, uh, ran a church there while I was at Harvard Divinity School. But, you know, it, it's very easy to, and I think this is part of the problem with the Green Party, it's very easy just to talk amongst ourselves without truly reaching out uh, to those people who are suffering. And I think that a lot of what has to be done in the left, and I think this is where labor unions once played an important role of this, is that we have to build real relationships with the oppressed. Uh, I mean, genuine relationships. And uh, one of the heartening aspects of the protests following the George Floyd killing was that I saw in most cases, this was these movements were being led not by white people, um, but by people who actually knew uh, what was happening on the streets of their cities, almost all people of color. Um, uh, so there needs to be, you know, too often the left retreated into the kind of the boutique activism of uh, multiculturalism and diversity and identity politics uh, and forgot the primacy of economic justice while uh, the lives of people in marginal communities were being devastated and destroyed. Um, we have to regain the language of class conflict um, and we have to organize around issues that will uh, improve and empower the lives of those people who are being oppressed. I mean, we, we've just inverted the whole uh, definition, for instance, of feminism. I mean, feminism and second wave feminism under Andrea Dworkin, who I admire, uh, is about empowering oppressed women. It's not about making a woman president or a woman CEO of Hewlett Packard or anything else, because they will simply serve the system. That's just a form of corporate colonialism. Uh, so I think a lot of, <clears throat> I mean, the left has kind of retreated into itself many times. Um, uh, and, and I think that uh, you, you know, it, it's going to be a long, hard, difficult fight. We may, in fact, lose uh, because uh, the popular movements have been ruthlessly dismantled and repressed and destroyed starting in the early 1970s when Samuel Huntington, who I knew was at Harvard, uh, you know, uh, along with uh, Lewis Powell and others, uh, wrote the blueprint for destroying what, what, what Huntington called the ex, these movements that America's excess of democracy, he called it. And they've been very effective in the universities, in the press, uh, in, in, in creating situations. I mean, and the Taft-Hartley Act was crippling, but it's uh, just in, in uh, you know, right to work laws and everything else that, uh, you know, there's just been a long decades long campaign and we almost have to start from scratch. 
Thank you, Chris. Uh, we have a couple more people in the, more than a couple actually, that have indicated they want to speak. We may not be able to get to everyone unless we go over time. I don't know if we are authorized, if I am authorized to say that. I just want to put that out to Dean, who is really anchoring this event. First off, we have a question from someone on YouTube. Uh, my colleague from UMass Boston, uh, Tony, Professor uh, Dr. Tony Vandermeer actually asks a question, I think a good follow-up. I have to read it for him, he's not on the Zoom. He asks, how do we build off of the mass mobilizations in the streets that reacted to racist police murders of black and brown work poor and working class people? And a related question, why is there such a disconnect between the left and the oppressed uh, at this moment? Two, obviously, big questions, but I don't wanna preempt um, Phil, Al uh, Phil Alvin, Sherry and Charles, if you could all be brief with your question or comment so we can get in as many voices as possible before one. Thank you, uh, Phil. Hi, Chris. Thank you for everything that you're doing. My question is in regard to employee owned companies. I see this as being a way for empowering employees to be able to both receive the uh, profit from their, um, from their the companies and also to have a sense of power in terms of, of over their lives. Um, I see this as, as being a way of countering despair. And um, uh, so could you please share your thoughts and if this is a good idea? And if so, how can we help bring it about? Great. Alvin? Uh, I see you have a Christmas tree in the background. I, I understand you have uh, children, but some explanation for that. But you talk, you don't mention uh, Marxism or socialism very much in the decadence of capitalism. You don't seem to place a lot of emphasis on the horror of capitalism. Okay, Sherry and Charles, and then Charles. Hello, um, I'm wondering why climate- You're still speaking on Sherry's. <laughs> Yeah, I'm speaking on Sherry's pad, and uh, my name is John Amadon. Anyway, I'm wondering why uh, climate disruption isn't factored in to these discussions uh, in a comprehensive way. I mean, we know the coral reefs are dying, the polar caps are melting, California is burning, and assuming that um, you know COVID uh, is a climate um, factor, also the the reason Trump lost the election is because of incompetence and the collapse of the economy due to COVID. And that's not mentioned either, but mostly I'm concerned with the real environmental disruption uh, that we've seen demonstrated by Katrina and um, the demise of uh, New Orleans for a period of time. Thank you. We'll get Charles in there too. We have some huge questions here, obviously, but I think it's important we uh, they, people be heard. So Charles. Hi, Chris. Um, I've been with Extinction Rebellion in Boston for about two years, and um, we frequently encounter Trump supporters on the street as rival demonstrators. Um, you mentioned that acknowledging the real pain that these people feel is important. Beyond that, do you see a hope of engaging with them? Because I've tried, and they can be tough. Thank you. OK, uh, back to Chris. Lots on the table. Capitalism. Uh, climate, the the summer protests, mass mobilizations, the Trump status of Trump supporters. Um, Chris, back to you. Well, I've written quite a bit about capitalism. Uh, I didn't, you know, talk about it at length. There's only so much. I mean, the talk was long as it was. Uh, but uh, the first chapter of my last book, America: The Farewell Tour, begins in an abandoned lace factory in Scranton, and then uses that to talk about. Uh, the savagery of unfettered, unregulated capitalism, how it commodifies everything, uh, you know, human beings become commodities, the natural world becomes a commodity, that it then inevitably, without restraint, exploits until exhaustion or collapse. So I have written quite a bit about it and spoken about it at other times. I'm certainly in full agreement of the, <coughs> uh, the danger of capitalism, including this book, Days of Destruction, Days of Revolt, uh, that I did with a cartoonist, Joe Saka, where we went to the poorest places of America, these sacrifice zones, to really say, you know, look what capitalism did here because it's now doing it to the whole planet. So um, uh, I'm in full agreement. Uh, in terms of uh, reaching out to Trump supporters, that isn't going to come rhetorically. Uh, it's going to come by finding out 
you know, what their ultimate concerns are, uh, probably economically, and beginning to organize around those concerns. So for instance, let's go back to Ralph Nader's example of attempting to organize Walmart workers. Uh, I, you, you are certainly, I suspect, going to find uh, Trump supporters among Walmart workers, but that's not the issue. The issue is to form a union for a living wage. Uh, and that is really the bridge. Uh, you know, why is the left so estranged? Well, I saw that in, in uh, Occupy Wall Street, certainly in New York. It was primarily a white middle class phenomenon, kids who were burdened by tremendous college debt uh, who couldn't find meaningful work um, and were suddenly experiencing for the first time what it was like to be economically disenfranchised. Uh, evicted, uh, 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 living in debt, peonage, abused by the police. Well, these kinds of experiences in marginal communities for people of color have been going back decades. Uh, where was the liberal elite? Where were they? They weren't there. And that's why uh, there was such distrust between people in marginal communities, East New York, the South Bronx, and the Occupy Wall Street uh, movement. And I think I found most of the people in the Walk Wall Street, uh, Occupy Wall Street movement were quite aware of that uh, failure uh, on the part of especially the white liberal elite that they should have been there and they weren't. They were too busy talking about, you know, diversity or, uh, you know, these kind of boutique. Uh, 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 and that's, uh, it is important that people of color and women, etc., and people with different sexual orientation are putting in positions of power. But, but you know, in, in these large universities, they're put in those positions only if they'll serve the system in the same way that Buttigieg and, you know, will go to the cabinet and serve the system. Um, and uh, uh, so, yeah, I think that's, that's why the disconnect is there and that we have to get back in touch with the core suffering of, uh, of the poor and the working poor and begin to uh, build organizations that address they're suffering that that would be for people of color as well as white people. Uh, and that will really be the route, the route uh, by which we can uh, push back against corporate power, which uh, now in essence, it's over as John Ralston Saul says, the corporate coup d'etat is complete, they've won. Um, and, uh, and Joe Biden, you know, was their handpicked uh, candidate. Uh, they don't, they didn't want Trump. I mean, they could live with Trump, uh, but Trump was an embarrassment to the empire. And Biden's main asset, like Obama's, by the way, is that he will restore a certain amount of respectability and gravitas to uh, imperial and corporate power. Thank you, Chris. I want to check in with Dean Stevens as to whether or not we can take uh, one more round of comments. We are right almost at one o'clock, which is what I was told uh, is our is our time frame. Dean, can we take a few more, or is it time to transition and just thank Chris for uh, for his for his time? I'm all ears for as long as Chris wants to be with us. You know, all right, Chris. Chris. Uh, so, Chris, a totally non course okay question. That? Chris, do you have a few more minutes for us, Chris? I, I can do one more. I have to do an interview with George Galloway. Okay. Okay. We definitely don't want to interfere with that. Okay. So, I'm going to ask everyone. In exchange for this this last round, which Chris is okay with, um, please keep your remarks as as short as possible, and I will keep mine at very short too. Uh, we're going to um, Canaan or Cannon, uh, Mickey and Ed, um, and if you could each keep your comment to one minute, uh, that would be great. And uh, Tim, we'll try to squeeze you into one minute each. Okay, folks. Thanks. Okay. Go ahead, Cannon. Yeah. Thank you, Joe. Uh, thank you for this uh, kick in the butt, uh, Chris. This is the kind of talk we need to hear every so often. So I have, a, I have three questions. I'll, I'll see how, how I can get to them quickly. What kind of fundamental social change will encourage the largest voting bloc, as you called it, 100 million or so, to become politically engaged? Second question, the consequences of crisis seem to be disproportionately suffered by people. And the coronavirus consequences are here. We have data. How can we use that as an opportunity to start to address these social inequities on an ongoing fashion, as opposed to waiting for when the crisis happens. Third question, what do you think is the Achilles heel of the system that's based on extraction and exploitation that we can attack and hope that the system can crumble? Thank you. Okay, Cannon, great job with three questions in one minute. Mickey. 
Um, I would just like to know, Chris, um, if you are a part of any uh, groups that are, that are with the cooperative network or solidarity economy network. Someone touched on it before, but I'd like to know if you're an actual active member in any cooperative network. Okay, thank you, Mickey. Ed? Yes, I'd like to ask about the migrations of people from uh, Africa and Middle East to uh, Europe and how that's affected uh, the nationalistic feeling there and 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 brought about like DM25. I'd just like to see what the thoughts are on that. Okay, and last but not least, Tim, quickly. Hello, Mr. Hedges. It's such an honor to be speaking with you now. Thank you for the speech you did today. My question is, um, I attended a webinar last month with Thomas Frank, who wrote Listen Liberal, uh, What's the Matter with Kansas and the People Know. And he spoke about um, this whole idea of there is a possibility of bringing these manufacturing jobs back. Now, he said there are steps that are possible. Democratic Party leaders said you can't bring it back. It's impossible. It's inevitable. They're going to go away. Are there actual like tangible steps to get these manufacturing jobs returned to America or is corporate power too influential to prevent that? Thank you. Great, that was quick. Uh, back to you, Chris. I know you may not be able to address everything, but that it's important for you to hear what people are thinking about. Uh, back to you briefly. As corporate power maintains control uh, and they have complete control, uh, Silicon Valley is going to continue to use uh, abused workers in China to produce their products. Apple alone, I think, uh, at least through subcontractors as a workforce of close to a million. Um, and they have no intention of bringing these jobs back uh, because uh, if they brought them back and paid union wages, it would cut into their profit levels. And uh, uh, Bezos wouldn't continue to make the insane amounts of money he's making, nor would all these other corporations. So um, I, I think that, you know, the appealing to a system uh, that profits uh, from uh, the uh, structures that are put in place is useless. Uh, these politicians serve this system. Uh, and that really requires that we begin to create external pressure. Uh, that's why I am a supporter of Extinction Rebellion and have engaged in uh, activities, uh, uh, civil disobedience carried out by Extinction Rebellion. Uh, in terms of the issue of being a member of a uh, a cooperative, uh, I, I am a writer, which is a very solitary, I mean, you know, I will engage in activities that are organized by various groups, uh, but I consciously cut myself off from uh, being part of the organizing effort because I'd never write. There's only so many hours in a day. Uh, I'm already teaching and I already have a TV show. Um, and in the end, I'm a writer. I just finished a book on mass incarceration for Simon and Schuster. And that really, you know, when I'm in writing mode, that is six hours a day from about eight to two every day, six days a week. And then that doesn't count all the reporting that goes into it and everything else. So uh, I just have to ration my time. So uh, I, I do think when we talk about climate, it is very important that we all become vegan. Uh, vegan. Uh, you know, and I became a vegan a few years ago uh, because of uh, uh, the impact on uh, the uh, environment. And you can all watch the film uh, Cowspiracy, uh, which I think does a pretty good job of laying um, this out. Uh, we have very little time left. Uh, of course, uh, you know, severe climate change is inevitable. Um, uh, someone mentioned the uh, melting of the polar ice caps uh, and the glaciers, uh, you know, raising the rainforest for cattle grazing and vast tracts of farmland uh, for these monocrops uh, responsible to for up to 91% of the rainforest destruction since 1970. Uh, and this loss of forests is the single biggest contributor to climate change. And it's done for animal agriculture, which is also the leading cause of ocean dead zones. Uh, scientists are saying that oceans could be devoid of fish by 2048. Uh, every minute, 7 million pounds of feces are produced by animals raised for human consumption in the United States alone. Uh, and the continued destruction of natural habitat, coupled with the factory farms, which use 80% of the antibiotics in the US and 
incubate these drug resistant pathogens uh, that uh, spread to uh, human populations presage more pandemics, like a kind of new uh, form of uh, the Black Death. Uh, so one of the things that we can do right now, and it's not hard, you can even eat really unhealthy stuff like Beyond Burgers and stuff like that that taste just like hamburgers if you must. Uh, there's no, it's really easy. Um, and it's, it's also better for you if you don't have a steady diet of Beyond Burgers and French fries. Um, there are things that we can do, that's one of them. Uh, so yeah, the climate, you know, again, it, you know, in a, in, a, in a talk like this, you just inevitably have to exclude things that you care about and that I have written on. Um, uh, so I would, on my last and final point, I certainly would push people to consider becoming vegan, having a plant-based diet. That's something you can wake up and do tomorrow. Beyond meat as a step towards beyond capitalism, perhaps. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Chris, um, for being here today. Uh, if we could uh, give Chris a, a round of applause, maybe even audible. I don't know if people could unmute themselves and, and be, be loud for a moment. I just want to say one. Woo! 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 All right. Woo! Uh, before turning it back. Thank to you, Chris. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. And I want to point out that if, if folks weren't appalled by my facilitating today, you might be interested in the show Shelter and Solidarity. We do a show on Thursday nights. We're taking a bit of a break for the holidays, but we'll be back in um, in January on the 28th. Chris, I'd love to have you on the show sometime. We've You can check out our website. We've had lots of, we've had 30 episodes with some great speakers you may be familiar with and, and ones you are not, but we're going to be doing a show on uh, socialist prospects, let me get the title right, socialist hopes and American realities, uh, precisely addressing some of the tensions that are coming up in today's show too, between the, the dreams and the ideas and the visions for the world we need, and then the, and the tension between that and the capacities and the opportunities that we see in this kind of very devastated present that we are in. Um, I just want to say, to Chris, thank you personally to thank you for fueling what you call our, uh, I think, the basis for sublime madness. I mean, we live in a world where um, it often seems like a rational calculation of forces, at least for those who have any option of ducking, ducking the bullets on the front line. Some people don't. Um, it doesn't seem like a rational calculation to pour your heart and soul, time and energy, blood, sweat and tears into, into resisting and, and fighting for this different world. But the paradox is if, we, if, if enough people take that irrational leap of faith mm. in, in the possibility of a different world, we may actually find it becomes quite realistic.